Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We are glad that you are joining us on Facebook Live and on YouTube for this worship experience. We rejoice and we are glad that our God is a mighty God and he is worthy to be praised. The waves shall obey thy will. Peace be still, peace be still, peace be still, be still. Join me as we pray. Lord God, we thank you for who you are, being our creator and our sustainer. We thank you, God, for being the one that wakes us up and clothes in our right mind. God, we thank you for being a prayer answering God. And today, God, as we come to worship you, we thank you for answering somebody's prayer that peace will come into their lives. God, we thank you that you are putting peace back into conversations that may have gone awry. God, you put in peace back into marriages uh, that may be going in opposite directions. God, you put in peace into children who may be estranged from family. And God, we thank you also you put in peace into our hearts for those moments when we've strayed from you. We thank you. God, we ask that as we've gathered in this space for worship, that you would just anoint the place where people are watching right now. God, in their living rooms, in their bedrooms. God, as they may be outside on the deck, they may be outside on the front porch. God, they may be listening with their earbuds on. God, we just thank you right now that you have a mighty word, a rhema word. And we pray that as we worship, continue to worship you, that as we receive your peace, God, we can do your will. Now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our most blessed Redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. To God be the glory, great things God 
has done. What a joy it is to greet you on this Sunday morning. Pastor Lanson and Dr. Carroll, who are our, our virtual pastors and doing a great job, I say thank you for being a part of the ministry team. And to our deacons and elders who uh, love the Lord and with all their heart and continue to serve. And to the crew, I'm going to call that, that's, that's the crew who is here uh, in the church as we uh, serve you, our AV team, our musicians, Dr. Monroe and your staff, and to all of those that make CNJ is a great place to worship. It is, as I say, it's a plum pleasing pleasure and a privilege to stand behind this sacred desk. Today, my friends, as we continue on a new series of growing and seeing the power of Almighty God, I invite you to turn, if you will, today to the Gospel of Matthew. And we want to read Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27 from an NIV translation of the word. That's Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. Here's what the word of the Lord says. Then he got into the boat and his, with his disciples, and they followed him. And without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I want us to focus, if we can, on verse 23, a part of this pericope that I think will serve as the background and the backdrop for what we want to lift up today. And here's what the Bible says. And then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. And with the aid of the Holy Spirit and your encouragement this morning, I want to lift up this text and for a brief moment preach from our subject, Moving in Confidence moving in confidence. Born, my friend, on October the 16th, 1997, a young tennis phenom by the name of Naomi Osaka, born of Japanese parents and a Haitian parent, has now risen to be the number one tennis player in the world. Naomi Osaka, my friends, that has won multiple Grand Slam time titles. Naomi Osaka, my friend, who is the number one, uh, uh, I would call it, economic machine. She, she makes more money than any female athlete in the world in 2020. Naomi Osaka, y'all, uh, took a stand, shall we say, last year on the issues of Black Lives Matter. She said in her voice, uh, I am tired of being silent, so I must now speak out on behalf of those who are being abused. Naomi Osaka, y'all, uh, spoke on behalf of the black men and black women who lost their lives senselessly to police violence and to street violence, but particularly those to which we mourn and we stood up in protest for and against their, 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 their brutality of killings last year. Naomi Osaka, y'all, uh, a, a, the number one tennis player in the world, took a stand. Now, one of the things I want to lift up about Naomi Osaka, y'all, as she played in last year's U.S. US Open Women's, Women's Tennis uh, Tournament, y'all, uh, she approached the tournament bringing seven masks seven masks to which she wore, and on those seven masks were the seven names of individuals to which she wanted to bring attention to. On the names of those masks were persons like Breonna Taylor, the first mask that she wore. She wore a mask for Trayvon Martin. She wore a mask for, 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 for George Floyd. She had seven different masks with seven different names, and that was her stance, y'all. Her stance was to protest and use her voice and her platform. She did this, y'all, with confidence. 
confidence, confidence. That is what I really want to talk about today. And I raise a question to you. What kind of confidence do you have to take a stance? What kind of confidence do you have to guide your life? Where do you make decisions? Do you make decisions with confidence or do you hesitate sometime to make your decisions? My friends, I want you to understand what confidence is for confidence defined by the dictionary is the feeling or the belief that one can rely on someone or something firmly with trust. Confidence is the state of feeling certain about something that is true. Confidence is a feeling or self-assurance arising from one's appreciation of one's own abilities and qualities. I like the way that Helen Keller said it. She says it this way, optimism is the faith that leads to achievement, but nothing, here it is, can be done without hope and confidence. I, I like Arthur Ashe, another great tennis phenom. He said it this way, one important key to success is self-confidence. An important key to self-confidence is, of course, preparation. Come here, Dr. Maya Angelou, for you said it this way, I can be changed by what happens to me, but I refuse to be reduced by it. I have confidence. And I got to quote a Reverend John Maxwell, John C. Maxwell, for he says it like this, when the leader lacks confidence, the followers lack commitment. I, I got to hang out there this Sunday morning and just give a word to somebody today. I want you as a believer in Almighty God to be confident. As a child of the King, I want you to be confident. As one who knows that God can make a way out of no way, I want you to be confident. The one who knows that God sits high and looks slow and looks beyond your faults and still meets, come on, somebody ought to say amen, in the midst of everything that has gone on in in your life, in the last couple of weeks, in the last couple of months, in the last year, matter of fact, let's go ahead and be honest, in this decade, in the decade before that and one before that, you are still here and you're here because of the confidence of Almighty God. What does the word say? I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's confidence. What does the word say? Weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And morning is not six o'clock or 5 o'clock or 4.30 in the morning. Morning is whenever you wake up. When you wake up from your sin, when you wake up from your stupor, when you wake up from your addiction, when you wake up from any and everything that holds you back, that is your morning. And you wake up, my friends, with confidence. Confidence, confidence. That is our word today. Go ahead and type it right there in the chat box because I want you to live and speak this word of confidence in your spirit today. Come with me to the text for it says Dr. Monroe in the eighth chapter of Matthew we get these miracle stories of Jesus the first couple of miracles that is recorded in the gospel of Matthew is Jesus heals a man with leprosy brother Sean then he heals this man with leprosy meaning that this God inside of Jesus is able to touch people that the world has put off somebody need to hear what I'm saying today because the God that we serve goes out of God's way to make sure that God is in your life and your way is made right. The next two miracles in the eighth chapter of Matthew, y'all, are the miracles where Jesus heals the servants, uh, the, the, the centurion servant. He heals a man who is not a believer, and he heals the man based upon the man's request. You see, that is important for us because oftentimes God will put us in a position and in a place, my friends, where it's not just we get to healing, but God wants us to be an aid to heal somebody else. Is there anybody here right now who would say, I am a living witness that I got my healing and my breakthrough and my delivery because of somebody else's prayer? You see, the text tells us also as he healed the centurion's uh, 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 servant, he also healed the mother-in-law of Peter. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, how, how you had four adults in the 
the same house and four adults with four adult attitudes. You had a wife, a mother-in-law, and two brothers. Lord, help me preach this thing. And Jesus stepped in and healed in that situation. And, to, and today I want you to understand is that God is speaking again a miracle, and this miracle takes place not with people, but with nature. Hear what I'm saying, my friend, that the God that we serve, that made the heavens and the earth, the God that we serve, that made the things that fly in the sky and crawl on the ground, and the God that we serve, that made us a little less than the angels, but well above the animals, is still able to speak to our situation. Look what the text says in verse 23, because we get this miracle coming up to us. It says, when G when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. Now, you might be asking the question, Brother L, what is the miracle about them following Jesus? Well, the miracle is they were devoted. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. The miracle is that when Jesus spoke, people became devoted. Old school, you know what we used to say, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Go Google that if you don't know what I'm saying. But what that means, y'all, is that Jesus spoke in such a way that devotion followed. Sister Margaret recognized is that the Bible says when he got into the boat, the disciples followed. Jesus gave the orders to cross to the other side of the sea in verse 18. But in verse 23, he and his disciples entered the boat. Don't miss it. In verse 18, he says, we're going over there. In verse 23, we're getting in the boat. He is given directions of what you should do with your life. The Bible says that we should honor our father and our mother, and our days will be long upon the earth. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it over. The Bible says, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not want somebody else's Cadillac, their Lexus, the Mercedes, the Chevrolet, the Toyota. The Bible says that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and spirit. Those are directions given to your 18th verse. But now in verse 23, Jesus says, let's go. Let's get to stepping. And as they step into the boat, y'all, here is what happened. Because of devotion, there, are, there is a following. The disciples followed Jesus, y'all, because of what they had experienced. Somebody looking at me right now, I want you to know that is your word of confidence today. That because God has already spoken something into your life, you ought to be following God. Because God has already opened up a door that no man can open and close a door that no man can pull open again. That is your word of confidence. Because God has stepped in when you stepped out, that's your word of confidence. And these disciples, y'all, they are following Jesus because of a devotion. Interesting, shall we say, in the text that these disciples did not question Jesus and his decisions to go to the other side of the sea. Hmm. How many of us will go ahead and confess on this Sunday morning that the reason we are not following Jesus the way we should because we got some questions. I'm not saying anything wrong with your questions, but understand God's got your answer. Whew, that was pretty good. It does not matter, does not matter, Brother Mike, that you got some questions. The thing is, you got to know that God, Miss P, got your answers. You got a question about what should you do with your life. God says, I made you my own image. That's what you ought to do. You got a question about your purpose. God says you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. You got a question about your manhood, your womanhood, your adulthood, your, your singleness. God's got your answers but you got to go to God to get it for yourself. Oh, how important it is for us to recognize, my friends, that the disciples followed Jesus because of devotion. They followed him, but the, and the Bible says that they followed him even though he had already spoken. He had already spoken, Minister Donna, that foxes have holes, birds of the air has nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He had already spoken that he would be crucified. He would be pierced in his side. He would be beaten. He had already spoken, but the good news, y'all, they had some hope and some confidence, even in the things that he was going to go through, he was going to be able to bring them through what they were going through. 
Oh, the good news, I don't want you to miss this, y'all. The disciples followed Jesus without any consideration of what it would cost them. We used to sing an old song in the church, Dr. Monroe, Jesus paid it all, all the him I owe. And, and the thing about it is that because God has already paid it all through our, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, whatever we think that we're going to have to give up to follow the Lord, y'all, it's worth it. Whatever we think we can't live without, it is worth it. We have to recognize, Brother George, that the disciples had already heard Jesus speak these words, but they had a sense of devotion about where he was leading them. What is devotion? Devotion to Jesus will motivate a person to go where Jesus wants them to go. Somebody type right there in the chat box where you God think God wants you to go. I believe you're going to type, God wants me to be more faithful and God wants me to be honest and God wants me to be more kind. That's right. You is kind. You is smart. You is important. I know that don't sound right, but anyway, it is true. Yes, it is. You see, the second thing I want you to get from the text is, is the devotion of the disciples, but also that the disciples are in a storm because of Jesus. Don't miss that. Verses 24 and 25, they tell us, it says, and without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. The disciples, they said, yes, we're going to go, Brother Sean. They got in the boat with him, Brother L. The, the storm was there, y'all. They were in the storm because they hooked up with Jesus. That don't make sense. I'm going to stop drinking and lying and cussing and get in the storm. All oh, that don't make sense. I'm going to stop gambling. I'm going to stop lying. I'm going to stop all the things that I need to stop to get in a storm with Jesus. You see, the thing is, is that just because you cannot explain it does not mean that God doesn't have a message for you. The thing is, just because you cannot make sense in your own mind does not mean God hasn't worked some things out for your mind. The Bible says our words are not God's words. Our thoughts are not God's thoughts. God has a bigger plan. God has a bigger purpose. God has a bigger calling on our life. Do you realize that everything God makes from beginning has a purpose in the end. Do you realize that every seed that God makes, there's a tree on the other side? Do you realize that every egg that is laid by a bird has wings on the inside of it to fly? Do you realize that every fish that swims in the water is supposed to fish because that is this purpose? What is our purpose? To love Almighty God, to serve Almighty God, to do the will of Almighty God in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ. You see, don't forget, don't forget, they are in the storm because of Jesus. In, in the storm, the Sea of Galilee, I, I remember going there a couple of years ago, and they told us that the Sea of Galilee is 700 feet below sea level, and there are canyons on the, all around the sea, and those canyons, y'all, are pockets of wind, and wind has a way of swirling up and blowing through those canyons and those wind, that wind must go somewhere and it goes down on the Sea of Galilee, and true to form, when we were there, the sun could be shining, and then in 30 minutes, there would be a storm. That was the Sea of Galilee, and I, I can imagine when the disciples got in the boat like most fishermen and boat people would do, they looked up at the sky, oh, it's going to be a pretty day to sail the day. They got in the boat with Jesus, and as they got in the boat with Jesus, they did not expect they were going to get into a storm. Am I talking to somebody here this Sunday morning when you got into the church, you didn't expect you would experience some storms in your life when you got do, into Bible study. You didn't expect Bible study would stir up some storms in your life. When you started doing the will of Almighty God, you did not expect that there would be some storms in your life. Now, the storm to which Jesus was experiencing with his disciples is a storm again that is combined with winds and those canyons and the depth of the sea and those storms, y'all, were what the word is simply is a seismic. It's where we get our English word seismic. 
seismic. It is not just wind, but it is the shaking of the earth, a seismic proportion. The storm was seismic. Okay, you're not feeling me because you think I'm talking about storms of wind and rain and water. But has anybody ever gotten the news that you got an incurable disease? That is seismic. Has anybody ever come home and found out the love of your life is not living anymore? That is seismic. I'm talking about addiction. That is seismic. I'm talking about layoffs. That is seismic. I'm talking about being fired from a job that you didn't think you would ever get fired from. That is seismic. I'm talking about divorce. That is seismic. I'm talking about Pookie in jail again, Nisi pregnant again, and you ain't got no money to pay for none of them. That is seismic. And the Bible says that even in the midst of your seismic storm, Jesus is there. Jesus is there, my friends. Don't miss that. They are in the storm with Jesus. And the good news, y'all, is that even though they are in the storm with Jesus, Jesus is asleep. I don't know why, bro, man, going to pick all the time of the day to go to sleep. Jesus, can't you see we in a storm? And y'all, the Bible says basically that, that the winds were blowing and the waves were tossing so that water began to come into the boat. Now, don't miss this thing, Brother D, because I found out that boats were made to float on the water, not to be filled with the water. Okay, you're not feeling it to, today. Bo boats, y'all, were made to float on the water, not to be filled with with, when, when, when boats start taking on water, they start sinking. When boats start taking more water than, than, than they can hold, they start going down. When boats start to take on more stuff than it cannot handle, it begins to go down. When boats start, start taking on more water, then, then instead of being high, the boats begin to go. You're not feeling this thing. When, when trouble starts coming into your life that you can't handle, you begin to go down. When people start talking about you that you don't know, you begin to go down. When, when individuals are, are, are saying one thing and doing another, you are going down. You are not meant to be down. You are a child of Almighty God. You are made in the image of Almighty God. You are the head and not the tail. You are the life of every situation. My friends, God made you. Ooh, 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 let me see. Let me see if I could help you see this thing because the Bible tells us, it tells us, uh, Dr. Monroe, that, that, that Jesus is in the boat with the disciples. Verse 24 says, and without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. I don't want you to miss that because there is a conjunction here in this text, a but. Now, a conjunction is a noun. It's a noun used to connect clauses and sentences and to coordinate words and the same clause. It is an action of an instance of two or more events occurring so you can put them together. That is what a conjunction is. You know what a conjunction is. Come on, you know what? What is it, Brother David? Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Hooking up words and phrases and clauses. Conjunction, junction, how's that function? I got three favorite cars that get most of my job done. Conjunction, junction, what's their function? I've got and, but, and or, they get you pretty far. Come on, you know that. Con conjunction, jun a conjunction uh, is used as a word to connect clauses. The Bible says that there was a storm, but Jesus was asleep. In the midst of the storm, but G the connection is that in the midst of your storm, you still have Jesus. And Miss P, when I found out that but is one of my favorite words in the Bible, because anytime I see the word but, I know that God is getting ready to show compassion and God is going to do an intervention. Anytime I see the word but, I see that I was blind, but now I see. I see that I was dead, but now I'm alive. I see I was sick 
sick, but now all oh, you missed your shot right there. Because anytime I can get that word, but that conjunction into my life, I know that God is getting ready to work some things out. You see, the word in scripture is there to introduce us to a conjunction of our lives that God wants all of us to recognize. Whatever you are going through, I got a butt to bring you out. Whatever you are in, I got a butt to lift you through. Whatever you're faced with, I got a butt to lift you up. Come on, Joseph, help me tell the story. You see, your brothers thought you was dead. Matter of fact, they sold you into slavery. You went to jail for a job you didn't do. You were put in prison. You lifted up people that put you down. But what man meant for evil, God meant for good. Come on and tell me this story. Help me out, Paul. Paul says, for you see, this calling upon me, brethren, is not by wise according, but not by mighty. But he says, but God has chosen to fold the foolish things of this world to put shame to the wise. Come here, Isaiah. Tell me what the Bible says. Have you not known? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unchangeable. He gives power to the faint to help them that, they might, that the mighty may be increased. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. But they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. But they shall mount up with wings like eagles. But they shall run and not get weary. But they shall walk. And now come here, Paul. Tell me one more time. I planted Apollos water, but God gives the increase. So neither he who plants or he who waters is anything that can compare with God, but God gives the increase. Oh, hear what I'm saying, my friends. When you see that conjunction in there in your life, and I want to put a conjunction in somebody's spirit right today, I want you to move away from fear. I want you to say, I was fearful, but... God has given me strength. I, I was down, but God can pick me up. I, I was lost, but God can help me find my way. Is there anybody right now can give God praise for that but, that conjunction in your life? Oh, hear what I'm saying, my friends. You see, those two words, but God, are the most powerful words in the Bible because it leads to holiness. But recognize holiness is not the way to Jesus. Jesus is the way to holiness. Hmm. Holiness is not the way to Jesus. Jesus is the way to holiness. And you see, that's why we come to the end of this text, because I want you to see what happens. The disciples, y'all, are in the boat. And the disciples are to be saved from the storm, Minister Donna, not so they can get to the other side and keep on doing what they've been doing, but the disciples are saved to be a different group of people. Am I talking to somebody here this Sunday morning? You see, you are saved not to go back and do what you used to do, but you are saved to be a living witness for all basketball moms. You are saved not so you can go and sit in the stands and root for your baby running up down the court, but you are saved so you can minister to the other moms and dads and children sitting in the stand. Business men and women, you are saved not so you can fatten your pockets and build up your bank accounts, but you are saved so you can be an example of what God is able to do. Suburban parents, inner city singles, people People who are just trying to make a way out of no way. You are saved not so you can go and just lift it up in your own living room, but you are saved to be an example on the blue line and the gold line and at South End and in Nodo and wherever you may find yourself hanging out on the weekends. You see, these disciples, y'all, were saved in a storm so that they can give us an example that when we go through our own storm, when we are going through a tough time, when we go up coming up the rough side of the mountain, that God will indeed speak to us. Let me give you my last point right here because this is important. Recognize there is some devotion that happens. Then there's a recognition I'm going to be in the storm because Jesus put me there. But recognize, again, I'm in the storm because of Christ, but I'm always with Jesus in my storm. Don't, don't miss that. Don't miss that. I got devotion, I answer the call, but I'm there with Christ. And somebody watching me this Sunday morning, I don't want you to ever forget 
that whatever you may find yourself in, if you are with Christ, you and Christ are going to see your way through. Whatever you find yourself facing this Sunday morning, where, wherever you may be, whatever is knocking on your spirit right now, I want you to be with Christ. For Paul wrote it this way, if anyone be in Christ, with Christ, or on Christ, if Christ is with them, they are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Hear what I'm saying to you because I'm inviting you to be with Christ. You see, when you are with Christ, you, you can resist the storms, you can resist the evil, you can resist the temptation. But now, don't think that you are too holy to be human because notice what Jesus says. Jesus simply says, why are you afraid? Oh, you a little faith. You're with me. Why are you afraid? Oh, ye with, with who've seen me raise the dead and, and heal the sick, why? I, well, let me just be honest with you because I get afraid sometimes. I see the hand of God and I hear the voice of God. But I also hear about senseless killings and senseless shootings. I, I read about the people who died in Atlanta tragically this week. I read every day about somebody in the Queen City who is shot and killed by gun violence. I read about those who, who had to take their last breath alone in a hospital room because of COVID-19 and family couldn't be with them. I, I read about that. So, so Jesus may be saying to me and to you, oh, you of little faith. And I did a study, Dr. Monroe, a study on, on what he was saying. The word little faith speaks of insufficient faith. He pushed a little bit farther, Brother George, because he's saying, don't you have enough faith to follow these miracles? And in essence, he was saying, why would you have cowardly faith? Now, of course, you know, I don't want to ever be called a coward. I'm not like the lion from the Wizard of Oz. I know what I want, but every now and then, some little faith creeps into my spirit. And I want to ask you, if you have little faith today, that you would take that little faith and make it confident. Will you make it confident? Will you make it confident? Okay, let me just, let me share this because some of y'all are probably wondering. They're wondering, they're wondering, whatever happened to Naomi Osaka? If she's the number one tennis player in the world, she won the U.S. Open, what, what happened to the seven masks and the seven names? But I found out, Minister Donna, that she came to the U.S. Open bringing seven masks with seven names. And they said, well, you only won a championship. But they say, Brother L, in order to get to the championship, she had to win one, two, three, four, five, six, seven matches. Okay, y'all didn't get it. She came, Brother Shard, with seven masks. When she packed her bag and flew to New York, she had seven masks, meaning she knew that in order for me to raise that trophy as a U.S. Open champion, I had to bring seven masks. She had the confidence to know that if I take one step, God's going to help me take two. If I stand up for righteousness, God's going to help me speak up for justice. If I stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves, I can stand on this platform and give God glory and give God praise. I got seven masks. I got seven names. I got seven matches. I got seven, the complete number of Almighty God that I have the confidence that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. As you've heard the word, as you ministered, been ministered to in song, we thank you so much for joining us and being a part of this virtual worship service. But we do not want to leave it there. We want you to be a part of this body of Christ. So if you are interested, if you would like to have a deeper walk with the Lord, go ahead and just type right there in the chat box. Call us at the church, email us. We do what we can to help you in your discipleship and your growth. I want to thank you for watching. I want to ask also that you will subscribe to our page. I want to ask that you will pray for this ministry. Pray for the church. We are in a different day and a different time. But we are worshiping the same God, the same God that woke you up, the same God that can get you up. So if you can, share this message, listen to it, 
be with us in Bible study and our, and our small groups, our, our, our fellowship affinity groups that's new, find it on the website. We want you to grow in your faith. I always say you got to go, you can grow. And I think this is a great place to grow in the Lord. So our words of benediction and blessing is go in peace, go in love, go in service, go believing in the confidence of Almighty God, that God loves you, God cares for you, and God wants the best for your life. I'm Pastor Cannon. And on behalf of all of the members and friends and the ministers of this church, we love you. We say God bless.